All right, this is a good passage. I'm not going to break it all down and preach it like an expository type message, but uh, but notice there at the beginning he's talking to them and he's kind of wrapping up his letter here to the uh, the his first letter to the Thessalonians, and he's just talking to him about you know how that they're supposed to uh, how they're supposed to live and conduct themselves. And I and I was just thinking about this I was, when he says you know abstain from fornication, and you know he's not really giving them a whole lot of details. Um, but he's given a fair amount of details when you com- when you compare it to, uh, if you remember what they what they were originally telling their, uh, you know, the Gentiles that got, that got saved. If you remember, there was a big discrepancy between the Jews there and uh, some of the Jews in Jerusalem, and Paul was coming at them, and, and 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 there were a lot of people that were trying to bring them back under the law and making them follow all these laws, and they're saying, hey, we weren't even able to keep all those laws as Jews. Why would you want to put that upon them? You know, like first let's just show them that salvation's free. I'm, I'm paraphrasing, reading into it a little bit, but just show them that salvation salvation is free and it's and it's easy to receive that, and then just give them because they couldn't like just stay there and have a church and just constantly be teaching because they were going off starting other churches and everything. But they said let's just give them just a handful of of rules and laws, and they gave them one was no uh, fornication, stay away from fornication, no idolatry. You know, I think there was four of them. There was one that said abstain from blood, you know, don't drink blood or, or something like that. And, and, and then the meat that was strangled, you know, the strangling. Uh, again, I don't necessarily need to or I don't think it's necessary to, uh, to explain what those last two were. I think he's just given a handful of things that affected their culture in that day. And fornication was rampant, you know, in that time, just like it is nowadays. That would be something that we want to tell people, you know, right off the bat. Hey, stay away from these things. We might go to the First Corinthians 5, you know, hey, don't do any of these big things, <laughs> okay? And then just try to keep yourself clean. But here he's expounding to him a little bit further, and he's talking about some different things. He says, you know, as touching brotherly love, and he talks about, uh, you know, how how they're supposed to love one, one, one another. Actually, in verse 9 he says, he says, I don't even have to write to you about that because you should know Holy Spirit's in you. You should learn. You should know how to love the brethren. Uh, but, you know, and then he's t- uh, talking about all these different things at the very end. You remember he says, you know, uh, don't to be don't be uh, uh, troubled. Uh, let's see. How does he say that? I would have, I have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep that you saw or not. So how about your loved ones that died in Christ? It's saying, don't worry about that. You'll see them again. And, and he's just giving them all these... Uh, you know, these, these helpful things to this church body. And then the one thing that stood out to me uh, when I was studying this actually a few weeks ago, going through this in verse 11, where it says, And that ye study to be quiet, and to do your own business, and to work with your own hands, as we commanded you. <clears throat> That's not necessarily something that you just hear preached all the time. Like, you know what? Just study to be quiet. Just mind your own business. You know, do, work with your hands. Live a quiet life. Study to be quiet. What does that mean? And uh, so, you know, I, I don't. I wonder what if you think in your head. I'm not going to have you necessarily uh, explain, uh, tell me, but well, just think for a minute in your head. Like if I say, "Hey, I just want to live a quiet life." I mean, what do you have in your in your mind? Me, the first thing I think of is like going off into like far away, living off the grid, maybe the mountains or something. <laughs> Just to me, like there's a quiet, what, you know, and I asked my wife, I said, what would you think? I want to live a quiet life. What's the first thing that comes through your, in your mind? And she's like, well, definitely get out of the city, right? That's just natural things that we think about, you know, just, I want to be, I want, I want quiet. I want quiet. We think about getting away, uh, going off the grid. She even mentioned like just totally unplugging from uh, from like social media, internet, and all that kind of stuff. And if you didn't have all those things in your life, you would just be quiet, right? And so I thought that was interesting. But, you know, a lot of people in the world today, I mean, maybe they would say that sounds, you know, intriguing to live a, a quiet life. But when it comes down to it, it seems like what they want is just this loud, everything on the opposite of quiet, loud, flashy, dramatic, uh, you know, extravagant. I mean, I don't know what other words you can think of. Uh, uh, but, you know, I think the complete opposite of that would be this quiet, this idea of quiet. And I would say uh, what would go along with that would be uh, meek, right? Meek and quiet. Remember First Peter 3, 4, you don't have to turn there. It's talking about the how a lady... Uh, 
uh, adorns herself, and it says not with costly apparel and all that, and it says, uh, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God a great price. He's like, hey, clothe yourself or adorn yourself with meekness and quietness. And, uh, and these are things, you know, that should be sought after. Another word, uh, you know, I thought about was modest, you know, to live a modest life, not flash that you want everybody to see and you want to just have, you know, for it to be grand and, and noticeable by everybody, but to be uh, quiet. Now, again, to me, there, there's something very appealing about that. There are times where I'm like, you know, it'd be nice just to be completely off the grid. No one knows who you are. You're unplugged. <laughs> you know, there are times I do think about that. But then I, the reality hits me and I'm like, you know what? We got family members. You got to stay close to them. You got to stay connected to them. You got friends. You got the ministry. Um, you know, and then there's a certain appeal that, you know, I have at least to keep up with other people's ministries and, and current events and to know what's going on out there. And it's hard to unplug and it's hard to like get away from it all. And it's hard not to be in the middle of some things. And sometimes even like, you know, you don't like the way something goes. And so you want to stand up and, and do something about it. You know, just not too long ago, uh, somebody in Iola that uh, comes to our church uh, from time to time called uh, and said, uh, you know, that they have a friend that just lost their job for not receiving the vaccination. I didn't really realize they were already firing people for that, but I knew it was just a threat. Uh, but this person lost their job, and uh, and her first thought was, you know, we need to do something. There needs to be protests. There needs to be all this. Hey, look, that's what happens when we start thinking about, and I'm not saying she's wrong. I'm just saying when we start allowing everything in the world to affect us, a lot of things, we want to react to it. We want to respond to it. We want our voice to be heard, and that's okay. And I'm going to get to that in a little bit. I mean, there's a time for some of those things, but uh, but we, it's okay also. In fact, Paul says that we should study to be quiet. And so I want to talk about living a quiet life, okay, how, how to live a quiet life. It's not wrong to want a quiet life. In fact, the Bible talks about that as quite a positive thing. Look at Psalm 107. Psalm 107. Let's start in verse 23. Psalm 107, verse 23 says, They that go down to the sea in ships that do business in great waters. These see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he commandeth uh, and raiseth the stormy wind, which lifteth up the waves thereof. They mount up to the heaven. They go down against the, again to the depths. Their soul is melted because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at, the wit, at their wit's end. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he bringeth them out of their distress. He maketh the storm a calm to the uh, waves thereof, uh, are so that the waves thereof are still. Then are they glad because they be quiet. So he bringeth them unto their desired haven. Now this is talking about men that, you know, do their work, do their business in the sea, right, on ships. And I love the, I mean, the word pictures that are used there. You got the, you know, it's, they're moving around like drunken men because they can't get their balance, right? It's talking about the waves that are up, you know, so high and the storm's coming and it's crashing. You really get this picture of these men that are probably all night long, you know, just struggling out on that sea. And you know what? They've had stress and they've had uh, turbulence and they've had all these, you know, trials and all that. And so when they're done... You know, they're happy for the quietness. And any man that or woman, you know, as well, but, you know, I just think about men, it goes, they go off and there's just like the stress, the stress, the stress at their work, and then they come home and they just want to be quiet. And a lot of times, I mean, this is not really part of the message, but a lot of times the, the wife also has been home with kids and all that, and she wants quiet too, right? <laughs> but she wants to be able to talk to the man. And like, that's what we all, we want, we want quiet. We want to get away from the stress. We want to, uh, you know, have a time of peace and all that. And so uh, we understand, we can appreciate 
this idea of just quietness. Like, I don't want the stress. I don't want the drama. I don't want uh, all that stuff. Okay, you long for, for quiet when you're in a stressful situation. And so I think many times when the Bible talks about doing the work, just working with your hands and just doing the job and, and, and you, know, you know, if you do all that, then you're really going to long for quietness. Your life is going to be uh, pretty quiet. We'll talk about that in a minute. But the uh, Bible speaks of quietness in the land as a blessing. A lot of times when a king came and the Lord blessed him because he followed after him, he would say uh, how it went on to the land. It was quiet in their days. I won't take any verses on that. But look at uh, 1 Timothy 2. 1 Timothy 2, you know, in a time when we have rulers... And leaders over us, and you could apply this to, to today if you want, but I'll say this, none of us have been around when some of the rulers were as wicked as, as Paul and, and the early church, uh, some of the leaders that they had to endure. <clears throat> but in our life, when we have rulers and lawmakers and people who are uh, just kind of hard you know, for us to live with, in a sense, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to pray for them. Because we want a quiet life. Look at 1 Timothy 2, 2. Or let me start with verse 1. I exhort therefore that first of all, supplication, prayer, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. And I think that's the key in that particular passage is that the reason we want our lawmakers to make uh, laws that would keep us quiet, having a quiet life, so to speak, was because, hey, you know what? Less people stopping us from doing the work of God, which is, you know, the basic thing would be telling, uh, bringing men to, to Christ. So we're supposed to pray basically for a quiet life. Lord, help the leaders make, you know, decisions and laws that will help us to be able to just live a peaceful, quiet life. <clears throat> now, our text that we read in 2 Thessalonians says uh, to study to be quiet. So if it's necessary, because look, I mean, we all have to have jobs. We have to be plugged into the world. We have to, uh, we have to be in contact with the things of the world and with the drama and all the situations in this world uh, that take place. Uh, you know, but if we're supposed to study to be quiet, well, you know what studying means. Now, studying doesn't always necessarily mean getting out the books and everything, but it means to apply yourself into in, into to labor to a certain end. You know what I mean? So studying to be quiet, you're, you're studying. This is what you want. Uh, your end result is you want a quiet life. Well, how do you get there? Well, there's certain things that you're going to have to apply yourself to. There's certain things that you're going to have to focus on. And that's what the message is going to be. I'm just going to share a few points uh, about how we uh, need to, some things that we need to do if we're going to study to be quiet. Let me first explain, though, what I mean by, because I, I bring up the word drama a lot. And, uh, you know, in some uh, I've accused, a lot of times Facebook stuff, people post stuff online or whatever, and I'll say, man, I just, I don't want the drama or whatever. Now, what do I mean by that? Because there's, you know, drama can mean a lot of different things. So let me explain to you a few things, and this will this will be helpful whenever I go into the main points, okay? When I say drama, let me give you a few different ideas of something that could be considered drama, okay? Uh, sometimes it refers to a person who dramatizes everything, uh, you know, Maybe you heard the phrase like a drama queen, <laughs> you know, somebody who just, uh, you know, uh, I just heard that uh, I just saw a whole bunch of, uh, of memes and stuff about, uh, Le was it LeBron James, I think? Yeah, King James, right? LeBron James, who made fun of uh, Kyle Rittenhouse for, for crying up on, this, on the, uh, the jury box, what's called the stand. And he's crying, and I guess LeBron James you know, made fun of him or something like that. So all these people are posting pictures about him. Basically what he does is he dramatizes every time he's hit or every time he's tripped or he loses a ball and he like dramatizes and he acts like he's crying and he's in pain because he hurt himself or something like that. And some people would say guys like that are drama queens. You like barely tap them and they're just like, ah, they make a big deal about it. 
And so uh, that's one thing we'd call that dramatizing, right? They're, 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 being, uh, they're being dramatic. And so sometimes when somebody is just, and we all have people like that in our life, as soon as they come to you, it's like you get some people, you don't even want to ask them anymore, like, how's your week going? Or how are you doing? Because they're just going to give you all this drama. And so sometimes it's like, hey, I don't really want the drama, you know? Now, again, I'll get to this in the point. Sometimes you have to just, you have to have it. It's inevitable. Uh, but that's typically what we mean. I just don't want a lot of dramatization and, and all this. Uh, just, I want it simple. I want it quiet, you know. Uh, sometimes it simply means gossip, you know, and uh, another word, a biblical word would be tailbearing. You know, a tailbearer is somebody who is, what they're doing is they're giving all this this gossip and they're publishing other people's business and, you uh, and uh, it's like, it's just like a lot of drama. And it's often like theatrical, you know what I mean? So that it gets everyone's attention. It's like, hey, you have to hear this. You have to know this and you have to do something about it. Hey, let's all raise awareness for this. Now there are certain things that get me like that and I can get kind of dramatic. You know, uh, uh, almost every time I open up Google, I get mad at that stupid Google doodle. <laughs> it's always something terrible. You know, this, this week is Veterans Day. So they got like this, this Google image that somebody drew, and it's like all these veterans from the different branches of the service. And then it's got like, they're all divided in half. And so like, you can see like the one half is like what they were when they're in the service, they're dressed in their dress blues or whatever. And then the other side is like what they do now. And so you have like maybe the Navy, they've got their Navy uh, dress outfit in, I can't remember what it's called. And then the other side will be like, well, this person is a is a doctor, you know, now, and so it'll have they'll be dressed in those clothes. And I don't remember what they all are, but they're all uh, show show that. And on the Marine, here's a guy in his dress blues, and on the other side, some guy dressed up in drag. And I'm just like, what? What in the world? I mean, we're talking about Veterans Day, and they want to pick the Marine because everyone knows Marines are supposed to be like these hard, you know, manly men. We're looking for a few good men. They used to be back in the day. That was what they said. So I was like, man, surely people are irate about this. And maybe I was looking for drama. I don't know. But I went down and I'm looking for different articles and I'm reading these articles and they're talking about, hey, Google's new doodle, you know, just celebrates, uh, uh, you know, diversity or something like that. And I'm reading the article. Nothing even explains that that Marine, everything's like hey, this one guy's dressed up like that. I mean, this one guy's a doctor and this one guy's this and that. And they left that. And I kept looking to see where surely somebody got mad about that. But you know what they're doing? They're trying to make it look normal. And so they're like, you know, hey, we'll just ignore this. Act like it's no big deal. So there's certain times like I feel like Christians, you know, that's kind of preaching. I'm not saying everybody needs to be a preacher in that way. But sometimes, like, especially a preacher gets behind the pulpit or he's got some kind of voice, uh, it's, it makes sense that they would want to dramatize that and say, hey, let's go, people. Let's not make this a normal thing in the United States. <laughs> let's speak out against this. Let's do something about it. And so I understand that there's times, uh, you know, to, uh, to have a voice and maybe even be theatric about something and, uh, and to, uh, uh, to make a big deal about it or whatever. But f for the most part, a lot of what I, when I refer to drama in this sense, a lot of stuff I'm talking about, it just has to do with stuff that is none of our business, right? And uh, maybe it is, ha maybe it has to be somebody's drama, right? And I'm going to get to this in the points. Maybe it has to be their, you know, that's what they're going through, but it doesn't have to be everyone else's business. At that point, it's like, hey, I just want to have a quiet life and keep to myself and my church and my family and not have all the, the drama. That's what I mean, okay? So Proverbs 26, 17 says, He that passeth by and meddleth with strife belonging not to him is like one that taketh a dog by the ears, okay? And so you wouldn't want to grab it, just be walking by some pit bull and just like grab it by the ears and be like, oh, it bit me. Well, yeah, because you were meddling with something that didn't belong to you. Okay? And so, uh, uh, so that's a great verse, Proverbs 26, 17. Proverbs 26, 20 says, where no wood is, there the fire goes out. So where there is no tail bearer, the strife ceaseth. You know, if there's nothing, no fuel to burn, it's just, it's going to go out. You know, and a lot of times, and I'll hear in a minute, I'll talk about uh, this same concept of being quiet to a fire. You know, how, how do we put a fire out? I've preached a similar message before. I don't remember exactly how I went, but I'll refer to an analogy that I've made before. Okay, so uh, so 
sometimes, however, here's an important thing, and I've already touched on this a little bit. Sometimes in our own personal life, we have drama. Okay, now this is the other last uh, reference I'll make to drama in this sense, okay? Here's what I mean. You got something in your life that is dramatic for you. You got something in your life that is a is a big deal. It's 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 not quiet. It's not modest. It's not meek. Like you have to deal with this. It's it's a big deal. Uh, look at John 16. This is what I would call drama as well. But guess what? This is strife that does belong to you. <laughs> It's, that's different than meddling with someone else's strife that doesn't belong to them. Okay, John chapter 16, 33. And because of human nature, we're all, we all lean towards, you know, we all find ourselves in trouble in this way and not living a quiet life and, and meddling in other people's business and all that stuff. And, and all I'm trying to say is, just like the Apostle Paul is encouraging the Thessalonians, we need to work at getting better at that. We need to study to be quiet. Okay, we need to, we need to work at it. John chapter 16, look at verse 33. It says, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me, this is Jesus speaking, ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So as long as you live in this world, as long as there's a devil, as long as there's the world in the flesh, you're going to have tribulation. You're going to have strife. You're going to have noise. Okay, <laughs> What I mean by noise is, uh, you know, in reference to being quiet, if you, you know, what is, what would make your life not quiet? Well, strife, drama, all these kinds of things. Uh, you know, so when I say noise, that's what I'm referring to. Okay. So, so we might not be able to live in a perfect environment, no stress, no noise. You know, you're not going to be able to go necessarily move away and go off into, uh, uh, some big property somewhere in the mountains or something and, and live off the land. I got a feeling that wouldn't be quite as peaceful and enjoying, and, and <laughs> you wouldn't enjoy it quite as much as you think you would anyway. Uh, but we don't live in that perfect environment. Uh, there's, we're, we're always going to have noise. We're always going to have strife and drama at the workforce or at home or even at church. We're not going to have these things. So what is it that we're supposed to study if we're supposed to study to be quiet what are some, some areas that we need to focus on? Okay, and I want to mention uh, three of them. Three or four, three. Number one. So here's what you do. And again, I've preached messages similar to this. And, uh, and this is just in my mind, just think, well, how do I remove this problem from my life? How do I remove the noise from my life? Number one, eliminating the noise makers. Okay, those things that are bringing all the trouble and the drama in your life, not necessarily people, but uh, just whatever it is that brings the trouble and the strife and the and, and the unrest. You know, how do you uh, how do you eliminate? You know, you got to get these things out of your life. Simplifying your life makes your life a lot quieter. All right, simplifying your life. Look at Proverbs seven. Proverbs 7. You know, and every once in a while, people realize their life's kind of starting to get cluttered. And maybe it's maybe the house. You just got too much stuff, the garage or something. And you're just like, man, I just got to just throw some stuff away. I just got to declutter. And sometimes in our own personal life, there's like, hey, man, I got too many irons in the fire or I got, you know. And sometimes people could go too far, which I'll talk about here in a minute. But, uh, but sometimes we're just like, man, I got to clean all this up. And I don't know, I, on Facebook, you see it all the time. Somebody be like, hey, I'm cleaning up my friend's list or I'm going to purge, you know, or I'm going to do something like I'm going to get rid of, of all these people that cause drama. And they're just like trying to get rid of, again, that's my word drama, but, uh, but they're just trying to get rid of all these people that are causing them, you know, these issues. And they're like, hey, one way that I'm going to have quiet I'm going to study to be quiet. One, one thing that I'm going to do is eliminate the noisemakers, and I'm just going to get rid of those people that I think are causing all the problems. Look at Proverbs 7, 1. My son, keep my words. Let me see here. Proverbs. Uh, uh-oh, what did I do? I hate when I do this. Okay, let me see here. Uh, 
Well, not quite sure what I did. Let's look at, is it 17? What'd you say? What, what chapter? Did you mean Proverbs 17? Or Proverbs? Probably. 17.1. That's it. Thank you. <clears throat> I wrote that by hand, so I must have messed up. Uh, better is a dry morsel and quietness therewith than a house full of sacrifice with strife. Uh, sacrifices with strife. Now, sacrifices would have to do with the meat. Okay, they would take, they would sacrifice that meat, and they would have a feast, basically. And so, it's better. He's saying to have a dry morsel, you know, like a like a cracker. <laughs> better to just eat a cracker, you know, all in quietness by yourself, than to have like a sacrifice and oh, a big feast with strife. Look at Ecclesiastes four. I'm glad you found that, man. That's that's a great verse. Ecclesiastes 4, verse 6. Very similar verse. It says, Better is an handful with quietness than both hands full with travail and vexation of spirit. So yeah, I understand the idea is like, hey, I'd rather have just a little and not have the strife and the vexation of spirit and all that. I would rather have just a little uh, than to have a lot and have all that stuff. And so the idea of decluttering you know, getting rid of uh, things that are going to cause too much stress. You know, man only has so much time in a day. And so, you know, you go to work, you got to church, you got to have some time with your family, you got to eat, got to sleep. I mean, there's at some point you're like, hey, that's that's all I really got time in my life for. So it becomes pretty simplified if you're like, hey, that's all I can do. As sometimes you get kind of used to your schedule, you can add something in here or there. Uh, but it makes sense to some people that, hey, the only way I can live a quiet life is I've got to eliminate some of the noisemakers, you know, so that I could have quietness. Uh, let me see here. Uh, I read a book here, I don't know, years ago, somebody gave me a book. It was called The Simple Church. And this is before I was pastor, a pastor, but I guess it was a conversation we had. I can't remember. And they sent me this book that they said was a blessing to them. And I read it. I don't necessarily agree. I don't even remember who the author was. I think it was like Andy Stanley or something, which I would not recommend. Uh, but uh, I read the book, needless to say, and uh, it was called The Simple Church. Now, here's the concept that I, I remember. It did kind of revolutionize, revolutionize my thinking. And at the same time, God was kind of putting in my life this concept about in, an integrated uh, service, you know, where the whole family's together and uh, it eliminates some of the many, many programs, because all the churches I had been in had just, you know, all these Sunday school classes, and then you had this ministry and that ministry, you had uh, the choir practice for the kids, choir practice for the adults, you had the bus ministry, you had, and it was just like this, going so many different directions. And sometimes it's just like overwhelming how much is going on. And you're like, you know, like, you had some people that were doing soul winning, but most people didn't have time to do so when because they're doing all this other stuff. And it's like, wait a minute, if we just, you know, stopped and said, like, what are the main things we need to do to start decluttering some things? You realize, like, all we really need is to come together as a family to worship God, have the preaching, you know, go soul winning. So that's our, our main objective. I think this book even talked about that. Like, we need to get out there and preach the gospel to people. And it's like, you know, if, if you have the main focus, it's pretty simple, pretty sim simplistic. You know, you're going to get a whole lot more done and you're going to have a lot less stress and, uh, and, and, and all that. So even in the church, you have a simple simplicity is, uh, is key there. All right. Now, um, separating from or removing sources of, of contention is, uh, is always going to help you to be re relaxed and all that. But here's what I want you to notice, uh, know as well. And to always think about this when you're like, hey, you know what? I just need quietness. So I'm just going to declutter. I'm going to get rid of everything in my life that causes me stress. You know, that's not necessarily healthy. It's not very, it's not necessarily good for you to just eliminate everything that pushes you to the, to the limits, you know. Uh, I kind of think about like our immune system, right? For a while, everyone's just like washing their hands with all this sanitizer and all this kind of stuff. And then somebody, you know, finally realizes like at some point, you're hurting yourself because you're eliminating too much, right? And it is possible for someone to just kind of get rid of everything in their life. And I don't want any stress. I don't want any, you know, friends. Hey, my family, I'm just good with my family. I don't need anybody else. I don't, you know, 
I don't need to go to church that many times. I don't need to do this. I don't need to go be involved in this program. And they eliminate too much. That's possible too. Now I'll tell you this, just between you and me, if you come to me uh, as your pastor and you say, look, I got too much going on. I'm going to have to stop doing this or that. I'm probably not going to be like, you know, no, oh, what are you, are you backsliding or something like that? Because I realize that this is the reality of it. Sometimes we do need to, uh, to like loosen, you know, loosen the, loosen our belts a little bit, so to speak, you know, give ourselves some, uh, uh, some room to breathe and have quiet, have some quietness. But I'll get to this in the next point, but the answer isn't always just eliminating, eliminate everything from your life. Okay. But if we're to study to be quiet and if we want to live a quiet life, one obvious answer, uh, solution to that is learning how to eliminate noisemakers from your life. Okay. Number two, is will be a little shorter and then number three would be the shortest, okay? Number two is this, controlling the noisemakers. Now there's sometimes you don't have to necessarily get rid of everything in your life that causes noise. And I hope you understand the analogy of the, the noise since we're talking about being quiet. Those things in your life that cause all the, the stress and everything, I'm just gonna call that noise, okay? Now just because there are a lot of noisemakers doesn't mean that it has to be more than you can handle. It has to be chaos. Okay. Uh, here's what went through my head whenever I was thinking about this is an orchestra. You know, there's a lot of instruments in an orchestra. And I'm going to tell you this, if you've ever been there when an orchestra is tuning up, that's noise. <laughs> okay. That's like, Hey, just one at a time. We just need one instrument. Yeah. But if you only have one instrument, it wouldn't be nearly as beautiful as the whole orchestra playing together. The problem isn't necessarily that everyone's too loud or that it's too chaotic or whatever. It's just that nobody has put it all into sync and made it sound good. <laughs> okay. So there are times where you've got things in your life and you're like, oh, this is causing me stress and this is causing me problems. It could be, maybe you just need to learn how to direct it to a point where it's not stressful. It's actually working. Things are working together. You know, that's definitely a possibility. Um, uh, uh, just because things in your life are noisy doesn't mean that there's no use for them. And, you know, there's a difference of philosophy. But, you know, for me, as, as some of you know, like I'm real hesitant to just like say, hey, I don't have any use for that person. Hey, that person is causing problems in the church or something like that. Let's get rid of them. You know, let's let's throw them out there. I'm thinking, you know, maybe God's brought them here, brought them here for a reason. Maybe there's some something that we can learn from them, something that we can do to help them to get to the next next point. But there does come a point for sure when you have to eliminate a person because there's just hey, you know, we'd rather have a handful <laughs> with quietness, right, than two handfuls well, with, with all this uh, strife. So, uh, so there is a time to eliminate people, but there's other times where we can just, you know, if God helps us, we can learn to control these things in our lives, in our family, in our church, or on the workforce or whatever. Uh, and, and look, this is just part of learning, growing, being mature. That's what First Thessalonians, how he started off saying, hey, we want, in fact, let, let's go there. I'm sure I can find it. First Thessalonians 4. He started out saying, furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus that ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God so that you would abound more and more. Okay. And then he says, uh, uh, let's see, but yeah, I mean, here, so basically what he's saying, look, I'm, you know, you're, you're learning how to do these things and we just want you to be able to do them more and more. You'll abound more and more. And it reminds me of, uh, of, uh, you know, the one that I was quote, second Peter one, where he says, add to your faith, all these things. And then he says, if you do that, you know, uh, if you don't do that, you're blind, but if you do that, you'll be fruitful, you know, you'll abound. And so, uh, and so this is what he's asking them to do. And it's like, you can always do a little bit better. So at first in our life, we might, the only way to, you know, if our life's just kind of falling apart, and you're like, I can't handle all the stress. I can't handle the noise. It might be that you're the type of person that says, I'm just going to have to eliminate some things and keep my life real simple. But as you grow and mature as a Christian, I think you can learn how to be the conductor, the director of the orchestra, so to speak, and get all those things working together where they don't actually uh, sound so bad. You know, they actually work together. And who's the great director is, is the Lord, right? <laughs> you know, so, so he had to put it in his hands, but he can show us how to do that. And he can help us get to the point wherever we can do that. Okay. So, uh, 
Uh, so then point number three is this. Dealing with unpreventable noises, okay? Because here's the fact, you know, in your life, there are going to be things you can't do anything about. There's going to be noises. Uh, there's going to be strife. There's going to be tribulations. Like Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation. There's going to be uh, persecution. There's going to be enemies. There's going to be stress, hardships, loss of loved ones, emergencies in your life. I mean, uh, all these things. Job talks a lot about quietness. If you look at what Job was going through in his life, and he keeps talking about, you know, how he would love to have quietness. And, uh, but he was out of his control. There was nothing he can do to get rid of the situation that he was in. And in our life, there's going to be times uh, where there are unpreventable noises. Now, again, a long time ago, I don't remember the message exactly, but I remember making reference to uh, a fire. And, uh, you know, sometimes in our life, there's different ways that we can put out a fire. Very similar principle to what I'm talking about tonight. So the first thing is to extinguish the fire, right? We've got to smother it. We've got to put it out with water or with some kind of foam, wet blanket, something we gotta, we've got to put the fire out. In our life, stress, you know, heart, uh, uh, strife, drama, if you will, when it comes around, we gotta, we've got to put it out and try to get rid of it. Uh, but sometimes that's not really possible. Now, sometimes there is what's called a controlled fire, Right, this was kind of point two that I made here. You, you know, you can use that fire for good. It can burn stuff the way that you want it to. You just got to control it and watch it and make sure that it's doing uh, what it is. But then the other thing is, uh, you know, you can remove, uh, and this is something I talked about as well, you can remove the fuel, right? So that that fire doesn't continue to have fuel that's going to burn. You just remove that fuel. And then the last thing is there comes a point where you can't do anything about it. Whatever is on fire already, it's just going to burn. I mean, there are some houses, fire department comes and they're trying to put out the fire and they're all night long trying to put out the fire. And they're finally like, you know what? The only thing we can do is stop the other houses from catching on fire and just let this thing burn. You know, sometimes uh, there are things we have no uh, control over that. You know, it's just something that we're going to have to deal with. And the thing is to remember that we can still, in the midst of any stress or trials, tribulation that goes on as Christians, and we need to learn how to get to this point to be mature Christians, we can actually live where it's almost like, uh, have you seen that meme? You've seen the meme where like everything is burning down around them and the guy's like, this is fine, <laughs> right? In a manner of speaking, like that's kind of how we can learn to be as Christians. Like when everything else is burning, now look, you need to try to control it. You need to try to get rid of certain things, remove uh, fuel so it doesn't con continue. But you know, you can actually be in the midst of all the strife and everything and still have peace in your heart and have quietness in your heart. Uh, so we need to strive to live quiet lives. We need to study to be quiet is what he says here in Th First Thessalonians. And, uh, and I believe that Lord will help us to do that. We'll have more productive uh, and peaceful lives. And uh, you don't have to feel like you're taking the easy way out. Like, no, I need more drama in my life. No, actually, you'll probably get more done if you simplify your life and you keep it uh, in order. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this church. I pray that you will help us to study, to, uh, to be quiet and have uh, quiet, peaceful lives. I do pray for our leaders and many making laws right now, and we might complain about them for, for sure, for good reasons. Uh, there are many things that uh, we don't want to see happen. And so we pray that you might uh, help us, no matter what happens, no matter who's in office, that you would help us to have uh, quiet and peaceable lives. And if that means um, you know, removing certain people from office or uh, having giving us state leaders that can... Uh, you know, provide a better environment for us than a lot of other states or, or whatever the case, Lord. But I do help, I pray that you will help us uh, to have quiet lives, that we might do your work and, uh, and work with our own hands and, and, and do the work you've called us to do, serve you in the church, and wait for, uh, f for your return, basically, Lord. So I pray that you just help us get as much, uh, thing, much done as we can in these last days. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.